So the title for my talk tonight, as you can see, is The Confederate Flag Goes Global, Where and Why It Flies Abroad. So we're going to talk a little bit about places where Confederate iconography, especially the infamous flag, pops up in countries around the world. And if you're my student in world regional geography, you probably have already heard a little bit about this from me. Uh, but as I'm continuing to build on this talk, I hope that um, you pick up some new insights tonight as well. And in what little time we have together tonight, um, I just want to let you guys know that I, I can't cover every conceivable place that Confederate uh, iconography or the Confederate flag has appeared, nor every country around the world. So um, this is a relatively new research project for me that builds on my dissertation work in Brazil, but shouldn't be considered a comprehensive overview of all the various scenarios and situations connected to Confederate iconography and memory around the world. Instead, we'll focus on three particular countries where the iconography has stirred some controversy and briefly survey some other interesting places where it has popped up in the landscape. And as this is an ongoing project for me, I invite your feedback, questions, and insights into this dynamic and, from my perspective, understudied and not very well understood global issue. That leads me to the broader uh, outline of how we're sp we'll spend our time together tonight. So here's what we're, where we're going with this talk and what to expect tonight. I'm going to introduce some scalar dimensions to the history of con Confederate memory politics. That means that we'll think through the spatial extent of where the Confederate flag flies, including not only where controversy over the, the flag occurs, but how events in one place can have impacts across regions, countries, continents, and as we'll see tonight, around the globe. Next, as I mentioned, we'll identify some places where Confederate iconography appears outside the United States. We'll focus on Ireland and Northern Ireland, Brazil, and Germany, and briefly foray into some other places. As I continue to compile a list of places where Confederate iconography and course, in particular, the Confederate flag pops up. If you know of a place not mentioned in this talk tonight, feel free to bring that up to help me build my global map of Confederate iconography. Finally, we'll explore how the Confederate flag takes on new meaning in the global landscape, while at the same time, consider how its presence tends to inflame simmering social tensions, reopen old wounds, and spur debates about history not unlike those underway here in the United States. I will argue that long-standing undealt with legacies of white supremacy and colonialism shape the surprisingly global politics of Confederate memory. But first, a little bit of background. Though many people think of the controversy around the Confederate flag and Confederate monuments, Confederate place names, as a new issue of so-called political correctness. The history of controversy around the infamous flag's use is not really as new as one might think. After the Civil War ended in 1865, the flag was not flown very much in public space, although Confederate heritage preservation groups were already working quite hard to erect monuments to the Confederate war dead and name places after Confederate generals and place them in strategically located places of geographical, social, and ideological importance, like courthouse squares, for example. It wasn't until roughly 1948 that the Confederate flag came to be used in a widespread public way, and that's largely a result of the political campaign of Strom Thurmond. Strom Thurmond was a senator from South Carolina who ran for president in 1948 as a segregationist Dixiecrat. Dixiecrats were right-wing, mostly white, southern members of a, a splintered-off faction of the Democratic Party who coalesced mainly around their objection to the civil rights program of then-President Truman. Dixiecrats were also sometimes called states' rights Democrats and they generally opposed federal regulations they considered to interfere with quote-unquote states' rights. And you can see in the, the center of my slide here 
that I have a, a, a image of a campaign button for Strom Thurmond's campaign that says states rights Democrat. Dixiecrats began using the Confederate flag publicly as a symbol of protest and reactionary backlash against the progress of racial integration throughout the 1950s and 60s. The photo in the top right corner of my slide shows a group of white Ole Miss students using the flag as a statement of protest against James Meredith's infamous integration of the Oxford, Mississippi campus in 1962. Mr. Meredith, by the way, is about my grandmother's age and is still alive and still speaking out and fighting for the civil rights issues of our time. The controversy around Mr. Meredith's integration of the campus is just one instance within a broader decades long pattern of Southern whites using the flag to challenge racial integration and other strides toward racial equality. More recently, two key events have set off the regional, national, and as we'll see, global conflicts around Confederate memory and iconography. First, in 2015, in the wake of the new grassroots Black Lives Matter movement, started in response to the murders of unarmed black youth Trayvon Martin in 2013 and Michael Brown in 2014, a self-avowed white supremacist entered a Charleston, South Carolina church and massacred nine black parishioners. News coverage in the wake of the tragedy showed him posing online with the Confederate flag and espousing other extremist views. Not long after the massacre, black freedom fighter Bree Newsom scaled the flagpole bearing the Confederate flag outside the South Carolina State Courthouse and removed it. You can see a photo of her doing so in the bottom right of the slide here. And then in 2017, tragedy struck again in Charlottesville, Virginia, when a protest against the removal of a Confederate statue commemorating Robert E. Lee and a counter protest of anti-racism advocates turned deadly. One white supremacist ran his car into the crowd of counter protesters, killing Heather Heyer and drawing substantial, increased, prolonged, and international public attention to the issue of Confederate iconography and public space. Thus, we can place issues of on, um, ongoing issues with flying the Confederate flag in public space within this broader history of controversy. And yet, this is typically considered a Southern regional or US national phenomenon at most in terms of scale. But as we'll see here, issues of Confederate memory are much more globalized than the general public and even scholars tend to recognize. For example, take a look on the right hand side of this slide at the list of countries where the Confederate flag has been documented to have surfaced. It speaks to the global dimensions of Confederate memory. As you'll notice, many of the countries listed here are in Europe, but others in Latin America and Asia stand out as well. The information presented going forward tonight in this talk is based on research I conducted and synthesized while writing an article for The Conversation, which you see screenshotted here. It makes the argument that I wanna make for you tonight, which is that wherever Confederate iconography pops up around the globe, controversy often follows as it becomes embroiled in those countries' own simmering racial, social, and religious tensions. Let's start with Ireland and Northern Ireland, which, by the way, especially for those of you who are in my geography class, are not the same country, even though they're located on the same island. Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, whereas the Republic of Ireland is an independent nation. In the city of Cork, Ireland, which is located in the south of the Republic of Ireland, fans of the local hurling and soccer teams have long flown the Confederate flag, which is sometimes also called the rebel flag, from the stands. And that's in large part because both teams are called the rebels, both their hurling and soccer teams are called the rebels, and their team colors match those red and blue colors of the Confederate flag. After NASCAR banned Confederate flags at its racing courses in June of this year, a Gaelic Athletic Association administrator announced that it would ban the flag at Cork soccer games too. 
At that time, many Cork Rebels fans had already taken to Twitter and other online forums to point out the flag's history and to encourage fellow fans to stop flying it. The 2017 Charlottesville tragedy cemented for many the flag's association with white supremacy. However, interestingly enough, Irish Confederate connections run deeper than sports. Irish Confederate connections actually date all the way back to the American Civil War. Many of the Confederate generals whose statues dot the U.S. South today, including Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee, were Scots-Irish. Their families came from Ulster, a region which includes parts of both Ireland and Northern Ireland. In a 2008 post called War of Northern Aggression, the Belfast-based photography website Extra Mural Activity featured some murals in the Ulster region, including one celebrating the Ulster heritage of Generals Lee and Jackson, which you can see pictured here. Notice that the top mural commemorates the sons of Ulster who led the Confederate army. One nearby mural not pictured here had a quote saying, my Ulster blood is my most priceless heritage by former US President James Buchanan. Another said, from pioneers to presidents. The Ulster region itself is interesting from a political geographic perspective and merits some further explanation. It includes the six provinces of Northern Ireland and three more in the Republic of Ireland. And there are some substantial cultural differences between the Ulster, the Ulster region and much of the rest of the island. The Ulster region is primarily Protestant in the first place, while the rest of the island is mostly Catholic, at least historically. That's changing somewhat with the increasing secularization of Western Europe. The region is also home to the Red Hand Defenders, a Protestant military, paramilitary organization responsible for several deadly bombings widely condemned as domestic terrorist attacks in the late 1990s and early 2000s. The extremist group coalesced around their opposition to secession from the UK that would have integrated them into the Republic of Ireland. The Red Hand Defenders have also been known to carry the Confederate flag, which I'll show you a photo of that in just a second. So in Ireland and Northern Ireland, to review, the Confederate flag has surfaced in association with the Red Hand Defenders on murals depicting the Scots-Irish heritage of prominent Confederate generals and at court soccer and hurling games. So there's sort of these three different contexts, right? This context of extremism, political ideology, uh, there's this context of um, sports games, and then there's also this sort of ambiguous kind of context as well of uh, kind of celebration of the Irish Confederate connections in terms of ancestry and heritage showing up on these murals. And so here's a photograph of um, the era when the Red Hand Defenders were most active carrying the flag. Uh, you can see it on the right hand side of the image uh, and you can see them sort of decked out in their, their sort of paramilitary uh, uniforms that they're wearing and the Confederate flag, um, you know, they're accompanying them. So that's a little bit about Ireland and Northern Ireland. But like Ireland and Northern Ireland, Brazil also shares deep historic roots with the Confederacy. In the slide, you can see two photos that juxtapose together capture the curious case of the Confederados. Both photos were taken from the local Confederate Museum where I conducted my dissertation research in Santa Barbara do Oeste, Sao Paulo state of Brazil. In one, the one on the, uh, the top left, you can see a large group of Confederate descendants gathered outside a chapel. They were the first immigrants to introduce Protestant Christianity to an otherwise mostly Catholic Brazil. In the bottom photo, 
you can see what appears to be a cotton field with a white man looking out over enslaved black laborers. While I've been unable to find any names of the people who appeared in the bottom right photo, given where it came from, I believe that this photo represents the dynamic of enslavement at the heart of the Confederate migration to Brazil. What is the Confederate migration to Brazil? After the Civil War ended, several thousand Confederate soldiers left the vanquished South and migrated to Brazil. There, farmland was cheap and slavery was still legal, and it wouldn't be abolished until 1888, making Brazil the last country in the Western Hemisphere to formally abolish slavery. Historical research on letters written to the Brazilian consulate offices from American Southerners and data from census records suggests that as many as 50 Confederate families purchased over 500 enslaved Afro-descendants in Brazil. The photos that I just described here came from this place, uh, the Centro de Memoria, which is attached to a local museum in Santa Barbara do Oeste. And uh, here's a picture of me doing some archival research there. Uh, I like to include this photo anytime that my former PhD advisor is on the call because uh, I like to remind him what it's like to actually do field work and get out into the field with research. And uh, I would hope that in a normal Zoom meeting or in a normal face-to-face uh, -face meeting, I would actually hear somebody perhaps laugh or giggle there, but you know, it's a tough crowd over Zoom because I can't hear anybody and you're not supposed to unmute yourself, so. I'm going to and I'm gonna say I smiled very hard. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. So here's a map of uh, the two most long-standing Confederate settlements in Brazil, where I conducted my dissertation research in 2018 and 2019. Hopefully it gives you a little bit of context of the study area. Um, and just for sort of a sense of scale, uh, the two towns are located right next to each other and they're about two hours by bus outside of the uh, downtown Sao Paulo area, um, located northwest of Sao Paulo. And as you can see in your inset map there, Sao Paulo is uh, in the southeast of Brazil. Uh, this is a basic reference map, which was made with the capabilities of geographic information systems. So if you're a CSU student on the call tonight and you're interested in learning how to make a map like this or how to make uh, other different kinds of maps where we sort of map a particular theme or a particular phenomena occurring across space. I encourage you to consider studying GIS or geographic information systems with me and taking my geography 2215 class in the spring semester. <clears throat> Today, Confederate descendants host an annual festival called the Festa Confederada uh, each April to celebrate their Confederate heritage. Photos included here from my field work show onlookers watching the presentation of the flags of the 13 Confederate States of America. That's what you can see there in the, the bottom image. Okay, the young men in gray uniforms and the young ladies in the yellow hoop skirts uh, holding all of the flags of uh, the 13 Confederate states. Attending the festival, one can hear the sounds of Alison Krauss and Alan Jackson over the loudspeakers as performers dance to the tunes of Dixie. Southern fried chicken, pulled pork barbecue, and beer are available for purchase alongside more, more uh, traditional Brazilian dishes like farofa and other Confederate souvenirs like flags, mouse pads, stickers, and more. And uh, this photo in the top right here is a, an image taken of the, um, all of these guys who are in the bottom photo actually before they're getting ready to go out and do their performance, uh, which you can see has drawn quite a crowd. Uh, typically each year they have around 2000 visitors um, and they have all of these ceremonies related to, you know, sort of honoring their Confederate ancestry and heritage. Uh, you can also see in the, the top left image there, there is a sign that says April is Confederate History and Heritage Month. And then the flags on each side of this banner, I always find to be so fascinating, so interesting because yes, 
One is the Confederate flag. Uh, the other, though, is uh, the, the Gadsden flag, which says, don't tread on me, which is, uh, at least in the United States, very, very widely considered to be an explicitly sort of political, ideological type of flag. Um, so whereas, you know, folks in different parts of the world, including Brazil and including here in the United States, suggest that the Confederate flag is just sort of this uh, innocent marker of heritage that's supposedly politically or ideologically neutral, um, it seems to me really hard to continue to make that argument if you fly it right alongside the the don't tread on me flag with the coiled snake ready to strike. Um, so I always uh, kind of like to point that out, that that's, that's sort of the entrance way into the festival that you see when you arrive. Some of the gadgets and souvenirs for sale that I mentioned that you can see are, uh, are pictured here alongside the festival's menu and a photo of plates customarily offered to tourists. Uh, so you can see in that bottom left-hand photo, there's uh, some miniature Confederate flags for sale alongside uh, koozies that have the Brazilian flag on them actually, which is what that little green and yellow and blue symbol is. Um, mouse pads, you can see there, there's stickers, uh, all kinds of things that you can imagine with the Confederate icon on it. And then some of these food items I always think are so interesting. The, uh, the top left image says porções confederados, and that's basically like Confederate plates or, you know, a Confederate menu. And so they have all kinds of different things like fried chicken, you can see fried chicken pictured there. Um, but, you know, many of them are also kind of mixed with other Brazilian dishes like polenta, and, uh, you know, things like that. So I think that's pretty interesting. You've also got your, your napkin here with the Confederados emblem on it with a, a burger that you can order. Uh, and then in the, the bottom right here, you've got uh, pulled pork with barbecue sauce on it. You've got farofa in the middle is that, that sort of grain, grainy textured um, dish there uh, with some cut up like tomatoes and onions. So this is an attempt to sort of show you that uh, there is all of this sort of what I would call in, in my intro to world regional geography class, a, a cultural hybridization going on, right? Where there's these, this mixture of traditional elements from the US South with traditional elements from, from Brazil in terms of food and dishes. Yet the festival is not just a, a step back in time. It's also emblematic of larger regional, national and global tensions around the historical legacy and memory of enslavement. Since the 2017 Charlottesville tragedy in particular, the festival has been met with resistance from black Brazilians who find its romanticization of the slaveholding South and those Southerners who colonized the area deeply disturbing. Pictured here are photographs from protests of the festival in 2019 when I was there doing field work. The protests were organized and led by UNEGRO, the Union of Black People for Equality. That's what you can see pictured there in the top left image. And uh, what's written on the sign above it is uh, Santa Barbara do Oeste, the only city in Brazil to hoist the Confederate flag. <clears throat> pictured in the lower right are two protesters engaged in capoeira a traditional mixed martial arts and dance hybrid developed by enslaved Africans in Brazil to disguise self-defense moves like swift kicks, for example, as, uh, as a dance form to avoid um, or to, to evade detection by those who enslaved them. Because if they were noticed as practicing self-defense, they would have been reprimanded. So they disguised their moves that they were practicing as a dance form to evade detection. The practice itself represents a powerful testimony to the ways in which black Brazilians not only register their indignation over the use of Confederate iconography, but also create spaces to reclaim joy, not just surviving, but even finding ways to thrive in the face of subjugation and marginalization. In geography, we sometimes call this the black geographies. And uh, I always find it so interesting to look back on some of these photos because you can see so these two guys in the bottom right, you can see smiles on their faces, right? Uh, but, you know, 
as the protest kind of ebbs and flows, you'll see moments of more seriousness and chanting and uh, saying, you know, take down the Confederate flag and um, stop erasing us and things like that. And then you'll also see them engaged in this, this traditional practice, beating on drums um, and practicing capoeira. And you'll see smiles on their faces, right, as kind of a way to reclaim uh, that space and reclaim uh, that place of memory. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about um, the curious case of the Confederates and Confederate iconography in Brazil, you can check out some of my written work on the subject, which has been published in The Conversation and an open access peer-reviewed academic journal called Focus on Geography. So there's the, the conversation piece that um, this talk is based on, which is a little bit broader and focuses on uh, the three countries that we're gonna cover tonight. But then there's also this piece that focuses explicitly on Brazil. And then uh, there's focus on geography, which I, I highly, highly encourage you if you're a geography student and you're looking for ideas about research projects or um, you know, interesting areas of study in geography, check out Focus on Geography because it's an open access journal, which means it's not behind a paywall. You don't have to pay to access it. Uh, it's got some great maps and graphics and images. And uh, it's, they're also really short and typically avoid the academic jargon that other articles have sometimes. So um, it, it's sort of written for a much broader kind of, kind of audience. So I encourage you to check out Focus on Geography if you're a geography student. or if you're not, but you're interested in what geographers do and uh, reading it in a way that is intuitive for someone who doesn't have a PhD in geography. So finally, um, let's talk a little bit about Germany. Yet another curious, though perhaps less surprising place in which the Confederate flag flies. For some neo-Nazis in Germany, the Confederate flag serves as a useful stand-in for the swastika, which has been banned in Germany since the Holocaust. Perhaps more surprising is the fact that Civil War reenactments also take place in Germany. And yes, I mean American Civil War reenactments. One professor of American studies has documented how some Germans enjoy participating in these reenactments so that they can choose to wear the Confederate gray and act out what he describes as Nazi fantasies of racial superiority. In those situations, the Germans flying the Confederate flag likely understand its historic origins and meaning, uh, as you know, at least in my experience, many people who do historic reenactments are very much history buffs who uh, do read a lot and try to understand the past and uh, what some of these symbols might mean. But that's not always the case for folks who fly the Confederate flag in Germany or elsewhere around the world. Take a look at this photograph. It's a picture from the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. High in the center of the photograph, you can see the Confederate flag waving. But why? For students in my class who remember our recent discussions of Europe, recall that between World War II and the late 1980s, the Berlin Wall represented the global social, economic, and political tension between allied Western capitalist countries and the Soviet Union. When the wall came down, many celebrated what they perceived to be the triumph of capitalism over communism and an end to the Cold War. Perhaps one explanation then for this strange, curious sighting of the Confederate flag at this really important global event is that the Confederate flag could have represented a, a symbol or a sense of anti-communism, much in the vein of its, or its origins as an embattled bastion of separatist impulses. Additionally, recent research suggests that German schools like many, if not most, in the United States, continue to teach the Civil War as primarily a battle over states' rights, evoking the segregationist Dixiecrat motto, instead of the desire to preserve slavery. Historians have debunked the states' rights theory of the conflict, yet many in Germany still view the flag as a symbol of freedom from centralized state power and control. 
and this is according to actually a recently published master's thesis uh, in American studies from the University of Washington last year. Sometimes people see it as a symbol of American culture in sort of a more generalized sense and admittedly lack awareness about the divisive political nature of the symbol in American public life. In this photograph, the flag was spotted painted on a car at a country music festival in Geiselwind in 2007. And forgive me, I don't speak German, so I could have pronounced that poorly. Um, where the symbol was likely seen as kitsch, a kind of pop culture symbol or icon. And I would argue that despite the symbol's contested nature in Brazil, many there also view it as sort of an American pop culture symbol. In fact, I would go so far as to say that many um, people in Brazil, especially from my research, would be kind of confused to hear uh, the Confederate settlers who migrated and settled in the area where I did my research. They'd be really confused to hear them referred to as confederados, even though that's the way that they refer to themselves. Uh, typically, if I were to mention los confederados to uh, someone that I met in town, you know, in the course of telling them why I was in Brazil or something like that. They might be confused about what I was talking about, but if I said os americanos or os norte americanos, they would know that, oh, the North Americans who came down here to, uh, to settle the area. So there's, there's um, oftentimes a sort of a lack of historical understanding about where these folks come from and also the, the sort of very contested nature of the symbol in American public life. And many as well view it as sort of, uh, in, you know, when thinking about it as an, a pop culture icon, many also view it as sort of a, a way to kind of approximate themselves to American culture. I very much found that to be true in Brazil, where folks didn't really know much about the festival or what it was supposed to mean or what they were celebrating, but they knew that it was associated with the United States, right? And so they knew that they could have a chance to associate themselves with the United States, which I think is oftentimes considered kind of a, a symbol of status or power, or, you know, I'm cool, I'm, I know something about the United States. Uh, maybe I can, you know, maybe I speak a little English, I can practice it while I'm there, uh, that, that sort of thing. So I, I found that to be true um, from my time in Brazil. Oops, let's see. Well, I think that's too big. Okay, what is that? <clears throat> so from these three case studies that I've offered you here, we can draw some brief conclusions. First, we can see that Confederate iconography takes on different yet similar meanings in other countries. Research shows that it crops up along those countries' own political fractures, religious conflicts, and racial divides. Flying the flag tends to inflame simmering social tensions, reopen old wounds, and spur debates not altogether unlike those underway in the United States. In particular, the Charlottesville tragedy of 2017 has led to increased public support for removing Confederate iconography from public space at home, while abroad it has forced people to contend with both the historic reality of the American South and increasingly its surprisingly worldwide 21st century legacy. And I'll say something just briefly about the Charlottesville tragedy. I found it to be very, very influential globally in, uh, in this work that I have been doing. Uh, in Brazil, for example, um, the Festa Confederada has, had been happening since 1980, and yet there had been no real public pushback or uh, protests that I have found documented uh, that occurred before 2017. And yet immediately in the aftermath of the Charlottesville tragedy of 2017, uh, Unegro, the group that I mentioned, had held a public debate with the organizers of the festival to sort of talk about what, uh, how to make sense of using the symbol and, and advocate for them to stop using it. And then as well in, uh, in, in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, particularly in Cork, Ireland, um, 
I think many of the, uh, from what I can tell from my research, many of the folks who um, have been flying the flag or, or other fans of the teams had sort of concretized in their mind the idea that, um, that the flag was associated with racism only after Charlottesville in 2017. I think that particular event and the way that it sort of garnered all of this national public uh, and international public media attention uh, has really kind of, you know, brought a little bit more awareness to this issue in places around the world where the flag has sort of been for a long time, but uh, there's not been a lot of awareness around its use and, and uh, that's, that's certainly changing. So to wrap up tonight, uh, I know I've already offered you my conclusions and you're waiting with bated breath for me to finish, but I've just got a couple more slides for you. Because uh, I want to show you some other places around the world where the Confederate flag and iconography have popped up. Um, so to wrap up, we can make note of some of these other places where the symbol appears outside the United States. In Liverpool's Toxteth Park Cemetery, for example, in the United Kingdom, Confederate soldiers James and Irvin Bullock, both brothers from our own state of Georgia, are buried there. James was a foreign agent for the Confederacy while Irvin served in the Confederate Navy. Little known about the city of Liverpool as well is that it had strong ties to the Confederacy due to uh, its, its shipping industry and also the trade in cotton. Irvin was at sea uh, on board the CSS Shenandoah and James was in Liverpool when the Confederacy surrendered. Not being offered a pardon to return to the United States, they remained in England. And in recent years, the Sons of Confederate Veterans have enjoyed the support of members of the Liverpool City Council in their commemorative endeavors there, including, as you can see in the bottom right, uh, you know, putting the Confederate flag, the American flag, and then the, uh, the sort of Confederate cross there on the gravesite. Um, and just another interesting note about this this particular case is that even the classic movie Gone with the Wind uh, makes mention of the city of Liverpool. So as Liverpool, like many other European cities, is currently reckoning with its slave trading past and its broader role within the history of uh, slavery and colonialism, uh, the, the monuments, memorials, and, and icon, icons are not really just limited to those folks who lived there in that area. They've also got this sort of transnational element to deal with uh, in terms of Confederate memory. And this photo on the left is a photo of the Sons of Confederate Veterans being received by uh, members of the Liverpool City Council and their dedication of a building, which I believe was some kind of uh, headquarters or outpost for the Confederacy abroad. And then as well, we've got other places like, um, like Warsaw, Poland, which you see here. The flag has popped up in association uh, in Warsaw with far-right political activists and demonstrations. You can see the flag pictured alongside this black flag, which is actually, uh, perhaps ironically enough, a white pride flag. And the 2015 demonstration shown here occurred in reaction to the country's acceptance of over 2,000 immigrants. In 2017, too, uh, when the current U.S. president gave a speech in Warsaw, he was greeted with a Confederate flag in the crowd. And uh, some photos and videos of that instance made their way around the Twitter sphere. And this one is perhaps a more curious case. Here, the Confederate flag can be seen in a fruit stand near Islamabad, Pakistan. And uh, admittedly, this is sort of a random photo that I got off the internet, and so I have somewhat limited information about it, but it was listed as near Islamabad. But the question that comes to my mind as I look at this photo is, is this guy who owns this fruit stand simply just, did he just find an, an image that he thought matched the red colors of the rest of the, the fruit stand? Or, and maybe this is a little far-fetched, but could it be considered an enemy flag to the United States in a region where the U.S. has a number of military bases and a strong militarized presence? Um, I leave it up to interpretation. I won't pretend to know the mind of the man in the photo. Um, but for me, asking provoking and important questions is 
at least as important as the answers that we come up with as researchers. And I hope that uh, all of you who are students who are preparing to do research, um, think about that as you start doing your own work, right? What kinds of critical and interesting and, and important questions can I ask even if the answers uh, are not clear? For some, the Confederate flag is kitsch, a kind of pop cultural reference to the United States in different places. For others, it has more sinister implications that more closely align with the flag's historic origins in the slaveholding Southern American Republic. What is certain in my mind is that as countries around the world are being forced to grapple with their legacies of slavery and colonialism and how far they have or haven't come in terms of recognizing those legacies and repairing the harm that lingers from them, understanding the global dimensions of Confederate memory politics is as important as it's ever been. So that concludes uh, my talk for the evening. That is what I had prepared. I thank everyone for your attentiveness and participation. And uh, I offer here for you a little bit of information about me, my contact information in case you would like to follow up with me. Uh, my email address is there. You can also find it on the History and Geography Department website uh, along with my phone number. And then I encourage you as well to connect with me on Twitter. Um, I maintain primarily a sort of a professional kind of presence on Twitter where I tweet about and retweet other researchers in my field and um, around issues of slavery and memory and racism uh, in the United States, Brazil, and around the world. So if you'd like to keep up with me on Twitter, you can follow me at JP Brasher. But um, otherwise, I will thank everyone again, and I ask that uh, Dr. Reese, perhaps, or Dr. Spears, whoever it's going to be, to facilitate the questions can, uh, can start now. Thank you, Dr. Brasher. Um, we have a, a few questions popping in here at the moment. Uh, uh, one is a two-part question from a member in the community, David Rush, and the first part of the question is, can you elab elaborate a little more on the do not tread on me flag? And how, and the other part of another unrelated question though is, do you know how far back in time the Confederate icon uh, icon iconography, sorry, I can see it there, um, in these three countries, how far back in time does it go? Good questions. Um, so in terms of the do not tread on me flag, um, I've always thought of the flag as associated with sort of the, the libertarian kind of Tea Party movement in the United States. And uh, I don't particularly know exactly where it came from historically, um, but that is my impression of where it came from. Uh, perhaps there might actually be someone here who knows a little bit more about that, that I'd be happy to hear from, but um, that's pretty much all that I know. Um, you know, you sometimes see it on the back of trucks fly, um, flying around, around the area, this sort of this idea that, you know, I don't want any, I don't want any federal government encroachment on my life, right? Um, and then the question, the second part of the question was about um, how long the, the flag has been present in other countries, right? Yes, that's right. So in Brazil, I'll, I'll speak to that first because that's what I know a little bit more about. Uh, in Brazil, the flag and, and related sort of iconography around the Confederacy has been present since the Confederates migrated from the U.S. South to Brazil in 1865. Um, but I would say in a very sort of, in a public way, you know, in terms of not just in someone's drawer in their house or displayed uh, on the wall or something in their home, in a public way, it's been uh, really since about 1980, excuse me, which is when the, um, which is when the Confederate festival started up. So, in, you know, actually in recent years in Brazil, there's also been some local parents at schools who have been frustrated and upset with um, the use of the flag for teaching purposes in the classroom. Um, so there's, there's been a little bit more sort of awareness, I guess you could say, and perhaps controversy that has been generated only in recent years, even though, um, even though the flag's been there for quite a while, been around for a while. And like I, like I said earlier, I, I think that, that that in my view is in large part due to the Charlottesville 2017 tragedy and the sort of international public media attention that the issue has gotten since then. 
Um, in terms of Ireland and Northern Ireland, to be honest, I don't, I don't really know how long it's been flown there. Um, I know that the, the Red Hand Defenders were using it in the late 90s and early 2000s. I don't know if, uh, and, and also the murals that I showed were from the early 2000s as well. But beyond that, in terms of the sports team, I don't know quite how long they've been using it there. Uh, perhaps it goes back further, I'm not sure. Um, and, then, and then Germany, um, I know that it's been for at least a couple of decades in Germany. Um, like I mentioned before, it's been sort of a convenient way for those who hold extremist sort of neo-Nazi views to express those in public because um, it's not legal, it's not permissible to use the swastika anymore. And I think unless uh, you're showing like a film or something like that, but it's not legal or permissible to like have it in your, in your yard or like show it in a public space. Um, but to, to answer your question, I really don't know how long in Germany. Thank you. Uh, Bailey Melton has this question. Based on your research, do you think if someone has Confederate iconic, uh, icons here in America that they most likely believe in aspects of Confederate ideology, for example, or racial superiority? Or are there just a lot of ignorant and uneducated people in America? <laughs> Uh, where is option C for both? I, I, I don't know. That's, that would be my answer. Bailey, thank you for your question. Bailey is a student of mine okay. in world regional geography. Um, to tell you the truth, I, I mean, I don't, I don't pretend to know what's in the, the heart of every single person who uses the image. But I will tell you that if we start to understand racism as an issue that is not just about an attitude or a belief or an opinion, and part of a, a broader sort of political project and a structure in society, then we can understand um, a little bit in a little bit more detail where some of these ideas come from. Um, I think that ignorance plays a really large role in it because there have been some really powerful Confederate heritage groups who have uh, played, a, played a strong role in not only erecting Confederate monuments and shaping public opinion about the past in terms of the Civil War, but also actually literally writing textbooks. Historically, many of the um, textbooks adopted by the state of Alabama, the state of Georgia, the state of Mississippi, for example, are textbooks that were literally written by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And so um, I, think that, I think that ignorance plays a really large role um, and sort of a, an, a, an unwillingness to empathize with uh, how it might make someone whose ancestors were enslaved under that flag feel when they see it uh, and how it might prohibit their, their you know, willingness or interest in public participation in civic life. Um, I always use the example of, you know, if, if someone says, you know, I, I think that we should keep this up. It's part of our history, part of our heritage. You know, I don't want to see it erased or destroyed. I always bring the example of Germany because it's a convenient example. And uh, if you go to Germany, you don't see statues to Adolf Hitler or members of the SS or um, anything like that anywhere in Germany. In fact, the opposite is true. You can hardly take a step in Germany without seeing bricks in the sidewalk commemorating the lives of those uh, who were killed in the Holocaust. And so, um, you know, it, it, to me, to my mind, it brings the issue of um, whether something is neutral, whether what we do is ideologically or politically neutral or harmless. Uh, I think the answer is no, that we're always telling a story in a very selective way about who we are and uh, what kind of society that we want to be. So that would be my answer to that. Micah Arnholt has this uh, question. He says, uh, something I've always found interesting is how entrenched Nazi iconography is in a lot of Thai pop culture. They have an SS themed boy band and even Hitler chicken fast food chains there apparently. I was just curious as to whether or not Confederate symbolism has ever spread in any significant amount beyond the realm of explicit Confederate influence in Europe and in Latin America. That's a great question, Micah. Um, to tell you the truth, I, I'm not sure and I really haven't seen any uh, any documentation online in any of the, the, the searches that I've done uh, for an example in, in Asia other than unless you consider 
you know, Pakistan as part of Southwest Asia. But um, I think that uh, my suspicion would be that the symbol actually appears in a lot of places around the world uh, as sort of goods and services and trinkets are kind of bought and sold. You know, this, those kind of imitation um, purses and handbags and t-shirts that you see in markets around the world in uh, some lesser developed countries. I, I mean, I, I've even seen out, outside of my research context in Brazil, not in the area where I was doing research, but in a different area, I went into a, a, like an, out, an outdoor store and there were Confederate t-shirts there, completely in a different part of Brazil, nothing to do with the Confederados. So I think they, they sort of pop up a lot of times in these kind of random places as kind of part of the, the United States culture that's been exported around the world and commodified. Okay, we have a couple of new questions coming in. One from, I think it's Nix or Nye Daughtery. Uh, I, and the question is, I heard somewhere that specific, that the specific flag was never used for the Confederacy and was only used by the KKK. Is there any truth to this? So admittedly, I am not an expert on the evolution of the flag. Uh, I do know that the flag changed over time as the war went on and in the aftermath of the war as well. Um, I don't know. I, I am also under the impression that the, the particular flag um, that we think of today as a Confederate flag wasn't used uh, in the war itself. I have read that somewhere as well. I cannot speak with any authority to that because it's not my area of, of research, but uh, Dr. Bowman, I believe, could probably speak to that if she's still on the line and interested in responding. I am still on the line. It's actually not my area of expertise either. I think that your um, conception of it um, is indeed the correct one, which is that um, there was, that it is one version of the flag, um, but certainly not the only one. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. We have a question from John Mallory Land, and it is uh, this, when the same individual or group proudly displays the Confederate battle flag and the American flag simultaneously, are they suffering from cognitive dissonance or do they not, or do they simply not understand what the Confederate flag historically represents? Well, uh, admittedly, with some of these questions, I'm starting to feel like I should have gotten my PhD in psychology instead of geography, because uh, some of these seem to be a little bit more focused on the human psyche, and, and they're certainly more complex than I can address. Uh, and, and I want to be somewhat careful to avoid overgeneralizing, you know, everybody who uses the symbol or this or that. Um, I, I don't necessarily know, honestly. Um, and I appreciate the question, but I, I really don't feel qualified to speak to it. Um, can I actually jump in on that one? Sure. That, that, that is one that I actually am more of a specialist on than the flag itself. Um, but um, I would say that there's a long tradition um, in the lost cause in the United States of feeling actually that the Confederacy was a true defense of American principles. So when Confederates went to war in 1861, they argued that they were the ones upholding the principles of the revolution. Um, they, call, you know, they, they thought of themselves as defending the spirit of 1776. And then after the war, especially with the lost cause as it emerged in, in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, you had um, lost cause defenders seeing themselves really as American patriots. Um, so uh, in their minds, it was actually them who were, who had preserved and were still preserving the true principles of Americanism. So what we might see as cognitive dissonance they did not see as cognitive dissonance, right? They, 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 they rationalized it and justified it um, by an interpretation of history that highlighted them as the true Americans. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. Appreciate that. Do we have any other questions um, through the chat? 
And while we wait, I want to encourage you to also follow the Facebook um, um, page that we have in history and geography where you can find future uh, lectures and other uh, opportunities to engage with others on intellectual conversation as well. There are also a few links in the chat box that are posted by Dr. Rees and um, some other people. So you might wanna to go to that and also just explore this topic a little further. I see that Melissa Moore has also posted a web link called allstarflags.com facts. So that might give you a little more background um, on the Confederate flag itself. And Dr. Lynch has posted all the handles for any aspect of our social media outreach from history and geography. Um, if there are not any other questions, I want to thank everyone here for participating. And um, Dr. Brasher, thank you for a very informative and engaging topic and conversation tonight. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I guess if I may just kind of leave with a, a final remark, it's that I think that um, when it comes to this issue of using the flag, seeing the monument um, in our public spaces, I think that one key place where in public discourse, public debate, public dialogue about this issue, we sort of start losing ourselves in the weeds is by trying to think about what is the true version of history that we need to be showing or what is the true version of history that exists for us to commemorate. Uh, you know, we have this issue of romanticization and all of that, but for what I think that geography as a, as a discipline kind of brings to the study of the past is that these debates over the past are not just about history. They're about how people make sense of where they live and their environment, which is a very sort of place-based geography approach to the issue. Um, so yes, it's about history, but it's also in a, in a very political and social sense about how people make sense of the area where they live and work and, and sort of their citizenship and their sense of belonging to that place, right? So I, I would, I'll leave you guys with that. Well put, thank you so much. Dr. Reese, I'll toss it back to you. Thank you. And I want to say thank you again for everybody that joined us um, from um, students and faculty and colleagues, as well as folks in the community, uh, both at home and literally abroad. Um, I am going to leave you with um, the, if I can find it, the um, poster for um, our um, next couple of speakers. If, if um, Jordan, can you see that? Is the poster being shown? Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, as you, if you follow Facebook um, and our other social media uh, opportunities, um, you will find links to sign up for those events um, as they come up. The next one is a couple of weeks, um, um, and then one in about a month's time. And one of our speakers, um, the one in November, is actually Dr. Sarah Bowman, who um, answered one of the questions this evening. And her focus will be on the uh, uh, Confederacy and uh, memorialization in the city of Columbus, Georgia. Um, thanks again to everybody. Um, and I'll look forward um, to maybe uh, seeing your faces in a few weeks time for our next speaker. Good night. Thank you. Enjoyed it. And again, anyone who wants to reach out and continue the conversation, feel free to send me an email, introduce yourself and uh, we can talk further. Looking forward to the next couple of talks too. Dr. Yeah. Crosswell, Dr. Bowman, yeah. it's gonna be great. Yeah. Well done tonight, well done. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jordan. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. Hey, Sarah, it's good to hear your voice. Okay. It looks like I did okay on time. We're finishing up right uh, uh, just a few minutes before our planned yeah, end great. time. Good. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll see the two of you on Wednesday. Bye-bye. All right. Yeah, see you soon. See you soon. Thanks, Marielle. Good to see you. Thanks for joining in. Do Dr. Brasher, could I possibly ask a question? Absolutely. 
Okay, I just um, thought of one. Um, just because there are so many things to build communities around um, and so many things to kind of rally behind, why do you think so many people are drawn to the Confederate flag, especially considering, you know, all of its baggage? Is it just white supremacy or is it just simply a lack of knowledge of Southern history, you know, because I think Southern, the South gets a bad reputation, but it does have a really rich history and things that are not the Civil War. So why is it just like a lack of education of other aspects of Southern history? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think, I'm not sure if I would say a lack of education, but perhaps a, a, a miseducation. Um, because, uh, you know, as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, there's been this really long and concerted political social effort to control the narrative about the South and control um, how the story gets told about what the Civil War was really about and um, to sort of kind of protect and defend the, uh, the integrity and the honor of white Southern gentlemen and, and that kind of thing through efforts of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the Sons of Confederate Ver Veterans. I think that these heritage organizations play a much stronger role than people sometimes realize in shaping this narrative because um, they've just been doing this work for so long and many of them are very, very good at raising money and uh, getting people to you know, go into churches and go into community organizations, getting people to, uh, to donate money so that they can build this monument or get this place named for Jefferson Davis. Or, uh, or you know, historically a little bit further back in history to get a textbook published that tells the story of the past the way that they think it should be told. And so I think in addition to, yeah, sort of a lack of historical awareness, there's also kind of this very concerted effort of, of miseducation um, through, it's primarily driven by these heritage preservation organizations. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. And would you say, in addition to like naming monuments, naming buildings after it, um, them specifically targeting curriculums, um, how important do you think that has been to really sustaining the idea of the lost cause of the South? Or do you think that's more of um, a family dynamic, something that's passed on from generation to generation? Or is it like society as a whole or like a mixture of family, school, society? I think it's all of them, all of them working together at the same time. Um, because, I mean, you think about the states' rights Dixiecrats, for example, you hear pu public politicians crafting this narrative and building an entire political organization, political movement around the idea of states' rights, which draws, of course, on uh, the narrative that white Southerners have been telling themselves for a long time about what the Civil War was about. Um, and then, of course, like I mentioned, the, the effort to explicitly write textbooks, the effort to not only build Confederate monuments, because I think, I think there's a real um, difference between placing a Confederate monument, for example, in a cemetery where someone's buried, um, who fought for the Confederacy, died in a war, in a very sort of private space. And again, I think this is where geography offers an interesting perspective that history um, may or may not be sensitive to is that there was an effort to locate these places in a public area, a public space, a place where public power is concentrated, courthouses, city circles, you know, the, the downtown areas where they would be seen and it would be known that this place that is supposed to represent the interests of all of its citizens believes this particular way about our heritage, about our past. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess I would leave you with that. It's really all of these things working together at the same time. And then, you know, actually, I'll mention one other thing. It's, it's, you mentioned the, the idea of family, which, you know, passing these stories down orally. I actually had a really just interesting experience with this myself a couple of years ago. I went to a family reunion. Um, I'm from rural Tennessee, and I have family who fought in the Civil War on the Confederate side. And, um, and I, I opened this family, this, they were passing out this bulletin at this family reunion about you know, recent people who died, um, happenings in the extended family network and all of that. But what struck me was that on the back page, there was this photograph of um, members of the local community, not direct members of my family, but 
members of the community where my family is from, who are posing outside of a church with a Confederate flag. Um, and so it, small things like embedding that image into a family genealogy bulletin that was being passed around at my family reunion are yet another way that this ideology continues to be passed down through generations. So yeah, like I said, it's all of these things working together to me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking, good question. Oh, we have a question in the chat um, about family diaries. Okay. Would you mind uh, curating yeah, that um, question for Yeah, I think me? Melissa was talking more about maybe uh, diaries in uh, the American South. If you can find diaries from both sides of the war, it's interesting to see perspectives from North and South during, during the time period. Did you use any diaries? You probably didn't use any diaries, did you, from me in your own work? Well, I actually mostly relied on research that had already been written about diaries, um, especially the diaries of those who migrated to Brazil. Right. Uh, but I didn't really deal with them much myself. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. If there are any other questions, um, please un unmute and ask. But if not, um... well, there's an interesting, another interesting question from Sophia, Ooh. which is that um, have you found a strong intersection between religion and the Confederacy in countries other than America, mm. or is that specific to America? Um, so it, if you will remember what I said about the Ulster region and the Red Hand Defenders of Northern Ireland, um, you know, religion has played a really strong role in the cultural conflict there and in the, the ideology that the Red Hand Defenders defended. Um, so Protestant Christianity is going to be the main religion, both in, uh, in Northern Ireland and in Brazil, that's associated with uh, Confederate ancestry. Um, religion does also, in fact, play a, a strong role in uh, the politics of commemorating the Confederacy in Brazil as well, because um, the Confederates were actually the first people to bring Protestant Christianity to Brazil. And they're very proud of that. They're, they consider that a key contribution of, from their, you know, heritage, ancestry, family group to the country, to the nation. Um, and many of them are, you know, continue to be practicing Protestant Christians to this day. So um, I would say it definitely plays at, at least a minor, if not a major role in Northern Ireland and, uh, and in Brazil in these issues as well. Um, Germany, I'm not sure. Not that I can tell. Great. Well, everyone seems to have turned their video off. So I guess <laughs> you're ready to disengage. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brasher. Really appreciate it. And uh, for staying around for some extra questions. Thank you. And you're welcome. And uh, we'll look forward to um, the next event in a couple yeah, of weeks. I'm excited about it. Thanks for the opportunity to do this. I hope that maybe some new connections can come out of this. Folks will follow up. Um, yeah. But this has been great. Thanks for all your efforts in organizing it. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Talk Bye, soon. everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.